All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, going to be calling to order the Code Enforcement Committee meeting for Tuesday, March 3rd. Uh, the time is 7.20. Uh, we have already done the moment of silent meditation and the Pledge of Allegiance in the previous committee meeting. So, uh, Madam Clerk, if I could have roll call. Roll call, Chairperson Urban. Present. Vice Chair Nickerson. Here. Member Roman. Here. Also present for the record, Code Enforcement Keen, Janice Jacoby, Village Clerk, mm -hmm. Christia Lou, Village Manager, Interim Village Attorney Powell. Very good. Uh, with the agenda, I would like to just uh, formally add uh, our Code Enforcement Officer uh, report. So if I I'd like to move item G1, which is the tracking report, to item G2 and uh, add item G1, which would be uh, Officer King's report. Uh, any objections uh, to doing that? Or would I have approval for, for approving the uh, approval of the agenda as with the amended items? I'll move to approve, Mr. Chair. And a second? I'll second. Very good. Any uh, objections between? No, we're all in favor. <laughs> all right. Aye. All right. Aye. Oh, yeah. Would the uh, uh, those in favor say aye? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Uh, any nays? Hearing none. Uh, the agenda passes with the addition of the uh, Mr. King's report. All right. Uh, minutes. Has anyone had a chance to review the minutes? I feel like the the software has been working better. Things. I mean, there's things in there but it does seem to be dramatically improved over how it was before but for, for this particular um, committee I didn't review the minutes for this one for the, for the public safety I did but I didn't get a chance for this committee but I will second if, if uh, I peruse I'm, okay I'm good with it I didn't really, yeah. okay. okay so I'll move to approve the uh, uh, minutes very good would there be a second, second. all second. right all in favor say aye. aye aye any nays hearing none the minutes pass uh, very good. Um, uh, we'll move on to good and welfare. Uh, if anyone would like to come up and speak uh, at the code enforcement meeting, uh, please state your name and address for the record. Hi, Jay Ribeiro, 225 Northeast 86th Street. I have some documentation I want to pass out to each of you. Um, yes, please. I'd like to bring this uh, item up to the agenda. Uh, and please don't take my conversation as if I'm being demeaning anybody or insulting anybody as I got that information back on a previous email, which I will discuss on another uh, Good and Warfare. Um, this item here, I've been cited for supposedly having an open ticket, open permit on my property. I am the least of the per residents here who's always on top of every permit. And I've always monitored permits for the community. If you could see the email that was initiated when I asked the mayor back then because I had miscommunication from prior code enforcement, prior office administration. The email clearly says, I don't need to open a permit. If your staff opened it, your staff is gonna close it. I don't need to be sanctioned or cite, get a citation for a permit that I did not open. So this is an item I wanna address. Now, secondly, are you pulling this because I am now speaking about a whole bunch of other um, work issues, code enforcement issues? Is this kind of a retaliation to me? Um, I, I, I'll allow Officer King to address that in a moment, but first I would like to say that as he's come on board, uh, what uh, he initially discovered was that we had incredible, incredibly incomplete records from prior code enforcement officers. So 
I would, I would say that as he's been on board, uh, one of the very first things that he began doing was going through uh, an extensive backlog of uh, uh, many, many, many open uh, uh, permits, citations that haven't been resolved, uh, full spectrum in terms of code enforcement. So, um, so I will allow Mr. King to address that. However, uh, before he does, I just want to uh, say that it would not be surprising in his efforts, which have been great and diligent, that, uh, that issues like this would arise specifically from uh, things left undone from our previous code enforcement officer, Carlos, which if you knew Carlos, may not also be a surprise to you. And so um, uh, I will just say that in my dealings with uh, Officer King that uh, he has uh, uh, been nothing but professional uh, from my perspective. And so um, I, I, would not, I would not think that retaliation would be uh, in his playbook. And so um, I do feel that it is most likely from his diligent effort uh, of bringing us up to date. For example, um, uh, now that he's got uh, proper equipment, specifically a camera that can also take video, high definition, et cetera, uh, he found many instances where previous code enforcement officers, not just Carlos, but, but going back a ways, had not been properly documenting uh, all manner of, uh, of different things, uh, you know, uh, associated with code enforcement violations and things like this. So, so I would just say that um, uh, it would, it would most likely be from that effort to get us uh, up to date with a, uh, a chaotic, uh, at best, um, backlog of, of files. So that would include uh, digitizing many files uh, to expedite um, the, the process of dealing with all manner of citations because a lot of these things were kind of just stuffed into folders poor organization and so uh, and so I'll, I'll start there and uh, if Mr. King would like to address the same issue then certainly. In reference to your property specifically in our system again I'm not privy to whatever email you were sent in our system you were showing an expired paint permit it is also a letter attached that's attached to your case file that was supposedly sent to your address explaining that you need to update the permit that was never responded to, and I have no record of it being responded to. So Ooh. let me let, let finish. Finish. Okay, so and even in my narrative, I said, please either have the permit finalized or canceled or closed. Didn't say that you did anything wrong. If it's not pertaining to you, you close it. Right. That's no different than anybody else in this village. They have that option. There's people who pull permits or apply for a permit, then cancel it. If that's what you did, then that's fine. But it's still showing open on our end. That's the only thing I go off of. It's either open, expired, suspended, or finalized. Yours is showing expired. Okay. That's a violation. So again, if an inspection is required, please renew permit or schedule inspection or cancel and close. Okay. You could, that, that, it takes two minutes. Definitely. And if it, it needs an inspection, you open it up. I personally come do the paint inspections and it's done. Definitely. And, and as far as me targeting you, you yourself brought up Sherwood Forest as having a lot of violations. Right. You live in that neighborhood. Right. I conducted a code sweep in that neighborhood, which is how I found the expired permit on your property. Right. And pretty much every single home, if not every single home in Sherwood Forest, has been cited personally by me, some cases twice. Right. So, I mean, again, I don't know. It says clearly here what, again, it's not personal, but if you want me, if you request me to do that, I'm going to do it. And if you fall under that, then, you know. Okay. To respond to you, it could take two minutes, five minutes for me to make a phone call and say this is a cancel item. But to respond to you, if you could read the email from the mayor to the manager, then to me, it said that for the paint, all I need to do is pay $25. I came, I paid for the $25. It doesn't specify permit was required. That's why I don't have the yellow copy. I can. always pick up a yellow copy when right. I get a permit. Right. I didn't get a yellow copy when I got this 
house painted. The pictures that are going around, the house is painted in the color that specified on the printout that you got from the right, computer. Right, I don't know who, I didn't explain to you how it works. When you pull a permit, a paint permit, you pay the fee. So I don't know who was here at the time. The Carlos. Permit. You pull a paint permit, once the house is painted, you call for inspection, me as code enforcement officer, I go out there and inspect it. If it's not inspected, by the time that permit expires, it's not a violation. Well, to your surprise, I did speak with Carlos when he drove by the house because, okay, because when I did come to make the payment, mm -hmm. he specified that I better paint the same way that I am putting the samples on Correct. or else he will have me repaint the house. Correct. So after the house was painted and he drove by, I told him, look at it. And he was fine with it. So if he didn't do his job, which basically to me, reading this email says, no permit is required, okay? If he didn't do what he needed to do, which I know for record he didn't do a lot of other stuff. Uh, Exterior print. I have the time right now to come and battle this, you know, and I had the time this morning to print up all my documentation, but this is an issue that's internally here, so don't come after me. Well, again, you raised the issue of Sherwood Forest as a collective, as a whole. And not only Sherwood Forest, I right. also raised it on 87th Street. And which, again, and every single one of those properties, but again, you are part of Sherwood Forest. You're a Correct. resident. So when I do a sweep of Sherwood Forest, a code enforcement sweep, your property falls under that. You're okay. not exempt. No. So again, the issue I have is whether it was Carlos, the previous building, it does show an expire. Yeah. And let, all you have to do is co update. And that's it. Yeah. Let me just let me just jump in here for a second, uh, Mr. Chair, if I, if I may. So, um, so what I'm seeing here, and 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 thank you for for uh, uh, Mr. King for coming into the code enforcement and as an officer and and, and updating all of our stuff. And thank you, um, um, Jr. for being here and bringing us this documentation. So, so so this is difficult. So what I'm seeing is is that. Um, and the reason why I wanted to jump in is that because you guys can go back and forth all night because it's kind of like a, because um, nobody was wrong. And so it's, it's kind of like a waste of time for you, for you two to go back and forth to each other. You know what I mean? Because it's not your fault and it's not your fault. Um, you're correct because if El Portal, if El Portal hires somebody and if that person doesn't do things the right way, then that's on El Portal. Like that's not the resident's fault. Like that was our hire. Mm -hmm. So our hire gave the wrong information. And that's why I took and it which, to which the is, mayor yeah, which is what I'm and looking I at. took like, it to it the says, manager. It says right here, it says no permit needed to paint the house. However, there is a $25 administration fee. Now that's the wrong information apparently that that person gave that was working for El Portal. You're coming on though and you're correcting everything. You're doing it the right way. So you can't be faulted either because you're doing everything the right way, the way it's supposed to be. And you're saying like, well, no, like there should be a paint permit that should be pulled. And that's the way that, that's the correct way of doing things. What I, what I'm, what I want to ask is um, for, the, for the chair, Mr. Chair, for the committee as a whole, um, and even like the manager, is there any way, and this is difficult because you don't want to open, because we don't want to open up where all the mistakes that our people have made in the past that they can come back and then be kind of undone to where we're not doing things the correct way in the present, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. We don't want that. We want to continue to do correct things in the present. But at the same time, I don't think that a resident that did things correctly from his knowledge based on the information that we gave him as a village should be penalized at this point because he in the present is not doing things correctly based on the past information that we gave him that wasn't correct. So if, if, there's, if there's some way to work around that to, you know, so that he's not penalized for. Okay. Um, if I may just quickly have I have one question for Mr. King just uh, quickly the infraction notice uh, that the resident is speaking about today in terms of uh, his question is is this retaliation for 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 
retaliation for what exactly? An Sorry. email you've been copying on regarding other um, code enforcement issues. Okay. And I understand so that for there's been sanctions. So for being you? active in, in bringing. Uh, I'm being active. Right. So so retaliation for your being active and bringing things to our attention. Correct. Okay. So, uh, Mr. King, the official title of this, as it appears here in the copy, says courtesy civil infraction notice. Uh, is there a fine is there a monetary fine attached no no, to, no okay no, no, no. not at all so okay so in terms of penalty here there is well, no penalty. correct so <laughs> so again um i so is it reasonable then to believe that now understanding that uh he did not realize that there was a permit open we're saying that there was the debate becomes should there have ever been a permit at all because of what the activity was painting a house the paint is done the work is finished it's just up to code in terms of the appropriate color. So now that we're all on the same page here, Mr. King, what is the next uh, step from your end? Again, I don't, I don't know. The $25 is administration fee. There's no administration fee. It's a paint permit fee. So I don't know why it was classified as such. Right. And why he was told he doesn't need a permit, but they charged him money anyway. It doesn't really. And this is and helpful that we're having this discussion so that we would yeah. be able to clarify this. I would, if I could. I'd just let the manager I don't know if this is gonna help okay. or not okay I will I will get to but the I do comments. have some recollection and I just double checked with the clerk she we need to double check but at some point recently what I think it was last year or somewhat we said we were not going to require a permit for painting right so right I don't know if that has something to do with what you know why this was still open or right that that was discussed over a year and a half ago and that's why well a month two or three months before I painted the house and that's why when I came and I specifically do come and check not only mm -hmm. do I code check mini code I came and I asked and I got answers two mm -hmm. wrong answers from Carlos and whoever was in the front desk mm -hmm. It then to I took the it up to the manager, and this is an email between the manager and the mayor. So then I have, okay. I have one. They open a permit. And I have I have one follow up for Mr. King, which I believe he just answered, which is you, you came across this because you are are as you're cleaning up yeah. the uh, backlog, you came across an open uh, permit and went to uh, see if the permit had in fact been completed or what's you know what what was the state of the work that the permit was pulled for and this is how we arrived at this situation is they that correct the permit so august of 2018 it expired in my records which i failed to attach they they sent the follow-up letter asking sure. him to and in the, the from the time then that the permit was open with or without uh residents knowledge the com the committee and then the council have uh have, have effectively uh, changed the requirement for this particular activity, painting a house. And so that additionally is why we've derived at this state of either uh, disagreement, miscommunication, what have you. I think uh, the manager certainly would. Please, like thank you. I just have to say, I do remember um, having the conversation with Carlos. I remember sending the right. email clearly. I did sit with Carlos and uh, he told me this information to pass along regarding um, the paint. Uh, I do recall there not being a permit, but some kind of administration fee right. for the you know doing that. So I understand this is a courtesy notice, and it, through uh, Mr. King's sweep, um, he wasn't going by persons; he's going by what he sees in his files and what's open. I think um, something that we can do is have Mr. King go look at your paint. Certify that There's it's the pictures. Okay, that's fine. I mean, There's we, the we're, pictures. Okay, but that's then he can sign off on it and we can move on. Right. There's the picture. So if this Sherwood Forest sweep was done in person instead of just electronically checking, no, no. you would have seen that the house is painted in blue. Well, again, that's, that's, the issue is the permit. You still have to close the permit. <laughs> I, I, that's, I understand what you're saying. But if you open a permit, you have to close the permit. Mr. Ch the permit. Mr. Chair. Well, so that's, sorry. <laughs> okay, well before we, I don't think we need to go much further now. We'll, we'll work on closing this out. And it's a courtesy notice. Um, we will you know, certainly um, fix this administratively and determine whether it's going to be an administrative fee or a permit. 
I, I need to sit with Mr. King because there was a time when we discussed not having paint permits, but there for some reason is a paint permit in there. So And that was prior to Mr. King. Prior so, to Mr. Yeah. King. So yeah. let us work on that internally and we'll certainly fix uh, the issue related to this courtesy notice that was provided to you. I just have one point for the record and that is that I believe he had said he had in fact paid the twenty five dollar fee. Yeah. Yes. So I just want to be on the record that that it, if it coming down to a twenty five dollar fee, he has in fact already paid it. So Councilperson, uh, Mr. Chair, just as an aside, yes, Mr. Attorney, um, to the extent that you do have an open permit and it's not administrative and closed by the village, it would encumber the property for future time purposes. So you should take steps, or the village should take steps to close out the open permit, um, because if you had to refi or, or sell, at some point it'll come back in a search that it's open once they did the lien search. Understood. Okay. I have that. Councilperson Nickerson. I was going to just say thank you, Madam um, Manager, because my first thing I was going to say is, is, is you guys, we, can we should just work to close the permit and, and, and get past this um, and, and simply do that. The second thing I was going to say, though, is, um, and you, 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 you kind of started to answer my second question uh, with you saying that as far as like from now, from here out, like, is it going to be a painting permit or is it just going to be a $25 administration fee? You said that you guys are going to talk to each other and handle it um, in, you know, um, within um, the administration. But if, but as we stand right at this moment, if somebody walks in tomorrow morning, what are we going to tell them? So even if we're like in an interim phase, is the painting permit the way that we're doing things right now, or is it the $25 administration fee? If somebody could walks in the office tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., what are we telling them? That's what I want to say so, so the residents can see it right now. They come in tomorrow and there's nothing in their writing given to a permit clerk member Herrera, it's going to be a paint permit. There we go. $25. Paint permit, my, my, my brothers and sisters out there. So if this one, if that wants to be, you know, that needs to be changed, then I suggest that and then, I have, I do have <laughs> one. Because I don't have anything in writing saying otherwise, if I, I don't. And to that degree, I did have one question for Councilperson Roman. Were you indicating that you said something about with the state of Florida? Would you clarify it about was that? Broad, I, I, you know, I don't, I'm going from what I can remember, and so don't quote me, but there was something that was happening in the uh, legislative agenda in regards to, you know, paint permits, and, and during that time, it's when we decided and we discussed would, would it. Would that have been in the previous fiscal year? That would have been either 19 or 18. I have no okay. idea. Okay. I have no idea. Um, and during that time, it was said that we were not going to have paint permits. And as far as I'm concerned, because I, when I was uh, the code enforcement chair, we also do not have an updated or anything to do with colors. No, we don't. There's so no color there's no color chart. There's no anything. And we were just getting rid of that fee or that permit. If I may. Mm -hmm. Please, Mr. Okay. Jane. Uh, there's a couple steps here. The permitting requirement is codified. So to the extent that the village determines that at some point it wants to change what's codified, there'd have to be an ordinance amending that provision. But that certainly does not stop the village council from saying because there may be activity at the legislative level when this was being um, discussed that there'd be a moratorium until there was a finalization of whatever is passing through the House and Senate um, before we decided to implement anything further in terms of fees collected for anyone seeking a permit. Um, this is the first time I'm hearing of this. I took a look at what um, Councilwoman Romy was referring to and was able to glean what the issue was in the legislature. There was basically an issue of transparency. And so what the legislature was looking at was a number of different jurisdictions at the local level had their own fees and contractors, homeowners and the like were not aware of what the different fees were. So the legislation that was passed requires that at the local level there must be accessibility by the public as to what the applicable fees are um, and they have to be posted at minimum on the website so that they're um, accessible to the residents. So that's what you were referring to. Um, but at the end of the day, if there was some resolution passed that said that there was no uh, permit fee 
being collected because of the council wanting to impose a moratorium on the collection at the time. Um, that's not forever. Moratorium was only have a short period of time. Um, and to the extent that the code needs to be amended to reflect that new policy, I don't have any issues bringing something back that would do that if, that, if I'm instructed to do that by this committee so that there's no confusion on anybody's part. Okay. Especially staff, because what this sounds to me like is that you had different people at different stages of uh, the work that was being done here, and the resident, unfortunately, was given mixed, mixed signals, and now we have a new code enforcement officer responding to a request for enhanced code enforcement and was not aware of what may have been discussed in the past. And then for further clarification, uh, we are all in agreement that whether a permit would be required or not, $25 is the fee. What is at, uh, in, in terms of disagreement here is whether or not it is, uh, it is officially termed a painting permit or simply a fee for painting a house. Is that, well, it's, is it's in both. a nutshell? Yeah, it's both. I mean, you, you, simp you don't just collect a fee from the resident without it being tied to a regulatory um, sure. or taxable reason so the $25 would be just there'd be no purpose for it right um, because we don't have a paint wheel here there's no color scheme so the only there reason was, why there was. Not, if you're right at this okay. point there is there is no um, that I'm aware of any color wheel that would um, sure the, the broad term of right. earth tones right yeah. right so so uh, earth's if, a colorful place so you can't have one without <laughs> the other you can't collect the twenty five dollars unless there's a permit application fee okay. associated with it um, so uh, I would I would like to ask if, if he could step to the microphone um, uh, my I'm gonna two questions maybe a question and statement we'll find out at the end of the city uh, one do you feel that uh, that this issue is, uh, do you feel you have an answer as to why this occurred and what the steps are to, to resolve this matter? Uh, I don't need an answer. I, okay. I was just bringing this up okay. to, the, uh, to the committee. Okay. Because and also so, the mm -hmm. another part that I did not mention is when this um, citation or whatever was written, um, why would you check off section one uh, the first box, section 100.1.1 Florida Building Code, alert, repair, move, remove, or demolish, when it's only a basic paint uh, work order? In the, in the pictures that you passed through, um, there was uh, the tiles. Uh, Two separate issues right. on the email. If you read the email, there were three items requested from the mayor and the manager to respond. I'll, I'll and my King. issue on that email is regarding the paint. Very yes, good. the okay. tiles, the picture of the roof tile was part of the email where he says, I could fix the roof as long as it's not more than $2,500. Right. Permit was not required. Very good. Oh, it, uh, you go ahead. If, you, if you'd like to respond, go ahead, Mr. King. Question, the question is, why was it tagged as a, a, a regular building permit, not a paint permit? Correct. Okay. The stereo paint, which I use as code, is for people who have discolored walls, the algae, the black, when they have black walls. You know, uh -huh. That's what I use that for. Because you, this is specifically in reference to a permit, that's why I clicked that. There is no other issue with your property outside of an expired permit, nothing. And you can have, you can close it, and it's done. This is we're going. I mean, again, I understand, but this is. It was simply a, hey, I took care of this. We can close it. So then I'll, I'll close with just a, yeah. com a comment. And so my first, my first comment would be um, uh, genuinely, genuinely, thank you. Um, you know, I worked in uh, in restaurants for a lot of years, and I managed restaurants for for many years, and. Um, and as a restaurant manager, for example, I'll just tell you that uh, if you don't get complaints, you're missing a lot of your business. You're not understanding a great deal of your business. And so without people bringing issues to your attention, uh, you never have a chance of, of understanding fully where your opportunities for improvement are and things like that. So I would, I would hope that no matter how you leave here this evening, 
that we have not discouraged you from continuing to be active. So um, I really, I really am genuine when I say thank you because I mean I really do wish that more residents were more active and and it, it gets noisy, it gets loud, it gets messy, it gets you know uh, complicated. But that's really how things get done. And so um, the other comment I would have is that hopefully um, out of this, uh, any residents you know watching this later on a video or, or or you know through word of mouth would. Would, uh, would realize that one, we do realize that in the past we had inadequate um, uh, activity from our end in terms of code enforcement, and that uh, I would hope that this would be an example that, that we, we really do have somebody who is uh, crossing T's, dotting I's, and taking a very serious look uh, you know, at, our, at our code enforcement situation. This is not you know, glamorous or, or sexy or things like that, but, um, but it is an important part of maintaining you know, uh, good neighbors and good order in the village. and so. Um, so I would, I would just say that I, I genuinely, uh, I, I hold no animosity whatsoever um, for active residents. I wish, I really do, as loud as and chaotic as it would be, I really do wish we had a lot more active uh, residents. So uh, truly, thank you. So. Okay. Courtney Kirk, 265 Northeast 87th. Um, clearly this is, this issue here is miscommunication, but I think we need to look at how we handle these sorts of things. Uh, this should never have come this far. The gentleman here is doing his job saying this is not right. JR should have been able to say, here's the information I was provided. And then the village should have said, geez, we gave you crappy information. It's on us. Don't worry, resident. You did what you were told to do. It's on us. He would drive by, he would not, you know, look and say, yep, it's blue, it's gold, whatever it is, and it should be done with. We shouldn't have spent the last 15 or 20 minutes going back and forth in this. And this will happen more, especially if the gentleman is looking through and ensuring that people have done the right thing, which many have not, either through lack of knowledge or trying to skirt the rules. So he's going to find some really good stuff, I'm hoping. I, I really am. I, I, I have a ton of stuff. <laughs> so, so just I would request that the village manager and code think about how they want to have the process of taking the old, let's say, incomplete information or misleading information that may have been out there and having residents come and say, hey, here's my backup. Not somebody who just says, oh, well, I would, wasn't told I needed a permit and I, you know, redid my kitchen. Oh, I, I'm fine but somebody who's done the right thing and has information. So that's a request there. Mm -hmm. The second thing in it, and I've been asking for this for two years, and I'm gonna beg again, put the notifications on the website. Say, 265 Northeast 87th was cited for this, 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 and this. That way, residents like me, who don't see our code enforcement officer, knows the guy's out there, he's busting his butt, he's doing his job. Because I'll tell you from, from my perspective, and it's an uninformed perspective, I'm telling you that now, I see the same trash that's been there for three months. It's in bagsters. Those will never, ever be picked up. They're gone. They were gone last week. They were gone this Monday. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I well, personally yeah. contacted the Waste Management. Thank you. Because the resident was under the impression that if you leave it out there, Waste Management would pick it up. So it's a bagster program. You have to call. And that was the miscommunication. I personally contacted waste management. And I thank you. And they picked so that trash is gone. Yep. The vehicles are gone. So, so uh, I, again, I'm, I'm just saying it because I don't see the information, and that's why I'm begging and have been begging to see the information. So I can sit there and say to, other, to myself and to other neighbors who say, oh, code enforcement doesn't do anything. Oh, really? He gave 17 citations last week. So you don't think he's doing anything? Too bad. Um, so that's my beg plea again. I, 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 if I may speak to that, I, yes, you begged and pleaded me with me about uh, publishing that information. I discussed it because I did take that to heart. I, I did discuss that with um, members of the council, and it was determined to just not do that. Uh, yet, I guess out of privacy or or just um, to encourage people to do the right thing. Um, so sadly, sometimes your neighbors do not comply and do not do what they're supposed to do, but we keep citing them. That's what we have to keep doing. And um, I, I know you want to talk, but I want to also go back to the other piece about um, you, oh gosh, 
the first thing? You asked for two things. The, f the first thing was a process for addressing when we have yes. old bad information okay. All that right. is so provided. That, um, Mr. King has uh, made some code update suggestions that you're going to hear about, I guess, if we ever get to that item. But we, um, we are working on those things, um, and, and we're of the same mind. So we're all on the same team with this. So just for reference, if you're not going to publish it, I will be making weekly public records requests for every single one of them, and then I will be publishing them. It's a waste of my money, and it's a waste of my time, and it's something the village should be doing. And so on that point, I will say that um, uh, at general council meetings uh, in the manager's report, she, uh, it is a blurb at the end of the general council meeting, but at every general council meeting, the manager does uh, uh, make a declaration of how many citations there have been, how many properties have been brought up to code, things like that. The, the danger, I will say danger, in, in publishing just, you know, as, there, as, as the citations occur in publishing those, uh, falls into the category of like public shaming, for example. Uh, so, so someone will make the argument because there are properties that are cited repeatedly. Mm -hmm. Somebody will make the argument that the village is trying to to shame them and the way. It, so, I'm, facts aren't shaming, Mr. Chairman. Facts are facts. So yes, and. I'm not telling you which side of that coin I'm on in terms of where my opinion lies. I, as, as plain devil's advocate, I'm just telling you what the flip side of that coin is. The flip side of that coin is somebody taking uh, a very real issue with airing some dirty, it's dirty laundry. And so, um, and so I, w I would maybe defer to perhaps advice from the attorney on this, but um, right, it, understood. Understood, but it is people's dirty laundry. And so, I mean, if you're looking at the if Officer King's, uh, you know, podium there, uh, that is a stack of papers. And so, e so understand that even how we came to this lengthy discussion uh, involving JR's uh, issue is is from his diligence, which is a departure from previous code enforcement officers' diligence, uh, which I commend. Okay, so. Um, I, I might ask the attorney a direct yeah. question on that in terms yeah, of there's, there's what the possibility of that would be. If, if I may, um, Mr. Chair, there's absolutely nothing wrong with what he's requesting. Um, the village can simply create a link on its website, code enforcement activity, and just simply list its public record. It's no yeah. different than going to the Miami-Dade County Clerk's website and punching in somebody's name to see whether or not they have a criminal record. Um, and we're not, as a village, if that's what you all want to recommend, um, doing like a lot of other villages who, who would actually post the property um, with some type of um, file on the door uh, with or or the like um, so I, I don't see any and I don't see any issue with that or, or that would even rise to the level of um, bringing about any criticism of shaming or anything like that okay so I, I will say that I will I'll say that as the chair of this committee I will consider that. I, I will consider that. Um, I do want to take the opportunity again to say that um, uh, at every code enforcement committee meeting, uh, Officer King presents a report, and at every single general council meeting in the manager's report is a declaration of how many properties have been brought up to code and how many citations have been issued that month. And, and I we don't uh, we don't item like, you know, in the in the general council meeting, the manager does not itemize you know which infraction and which property just a simple number of how many properties have been brought up to uh, code and how many citations have issued. So, And, and I, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, however, without the underlying information, when I walk by and see the additional three trash bags thrown outside, I don't know if he's already sure. done that or whether sure. I should be taking my fifth picture and saying, okay, I'm really going to send it to him this time. I got you. I understood. I will take it into consideration. I agree with uh, Courtney about publishing that information. We used to have a billboard inside the office with the note cards of the picture and the issue of the citation. So we're modern, get it on the website. The more that we see the dysfunction or the plurable properties that we have, we're not a bad community. but. The value of our homes for those that do make the investment is depleting 
from the deplorable properties, okay? Um, and I will have my um, request for public records submitted on two properties that I've been asking for. My final question to you is, how many citations do you have to give before bringing that individual to your board meeting? The more that you constantly follow up, and I'm not saying you need to be out there 24 seven, Mr. King, but the more that you follow up and reading the Muni code, it's within 10 days you keep on citing the individual, and within four of those citations, you bring them in, or four months, you bring them in, you may get resolution. You may get revenue collected. We don't want this to continue as what the trailer park happened, over a million point five in revenue that should have been collected, and it was negotiated to half a million, okay? And that issue went on for 10 years. Uh, as the last calendar year ended, we did uh, revisit our uh, hearing uh, process protocols and, um, and, uh, and recommitted to that. The, we essentially, it, as the chair I, in coming in knew, I wasn't aware that we had a hearing process at all. Uh, it turned out we did, we weren't using it. So we have, as the last calendar year ended, uh, reinvigorated that process essentially, reactivated that process. So I don't know if Mr. King would like to add anything or the manager. The process is not, they don't, they don't know they, about they it. Don't, they don't, the, the resident doesn't come before them for any type of hearing. The process is a warning whether verbal or on the door, they can request an extension if they choose, if they choose, and I can grant that. Then they get what is called an NOCI, and that's when fines can accrue. After that, if they don't comply, it's a special magistrate. It's not the code board who dictates, it's a hearing right. officer. Okay, so that's how it goes. That's per Florida Statute 162. That's what the state tells me to do. That's how it works. However, there are special circumstances. Not everybody has money falling out of their pockets. They may need extra time to fix their property. B, I, again, my job is not to punish. My job is to get compliance, period. I'm not dragging people out of their homes. I'm not beating them over the head. No. To, to, that's not my job. No. My job is to send a notice. You're in violation. Sometimes they contact me. Sometimes they don't. My compliance rate right now is about 80%. Okay. okay? That's better than Carlos. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, <laughs> okay? Better than Carlos. And, and, and per, per, per perspective, as far as my activity, in six months, I've cited over 200 properties. In Out of six 800. months. Okay. The previous 12 months, the total was 113. And half and the time. And we I've, know why. Manager and I have spoken about it. And 113 you know in why. 12 months. Absolutely. So I've done double the citations in half the time. Okay. That's not including my other ancillary duties I have around here. I'm very aware of what properties are dilapidated, and there's not that many. There's a few. Mm -hmm. But it's more maintenance and cosmetic properties around here. And that's a good thing, because you have a nice village. Correct. But again, I'm firm, but I'm fair. I'm not going to beat you over the head to cut your grass. You're either going to cut it or you're not. <laughs> and if you don't, I'm going to take you to hearing. Most people comply. Some people I have to give a little nudge to. But again, this is, this, my job is not to punish. And I'm not, I'm not out here for that. I'm just getting you into compliance. And I'll work with you to do that. Even you with your permit, the, the woman with the roof, somebody with a vehicle, they're having money, it doesn't matter. As long as you are working towards compliance, okay. that's, that's, that's my job. Thank you. I also want to uh, just speak about uh, sometimes uh, people who have citations come in and ask for an extension. And I just got an extension today. Do you want me to, do you, do you want it or? I have a copy of it. Oh, you have a copy. <laughs> Yes, um, a, a particular address that was um, complained about for Dirty Roof um, <clears throat> has now requested an extension of 60 days because she would like to um, completely remove and replace the roof. And um, I mean, we were pretty much headed towards hearing on this uh, roof. So unfortunately, you know, at this last minute, now we're uh, um, being presented with this extension uh, request form. But I mean, it's something to consider. So. You know, I, you I'm, know, is that? I'm up, I, I'm up for concerning, but I, yeah. I, if I, I would like to oh, yeah, uh, yes. give him an opportunity um, to speak first. Louis Guerrilla, 103 89th Street. <laughs> um, I do the same thing I sometimes. Just wanna, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say something about the code. And uh, because I keep uh, hearing 
about, a lot about not, you know, anything being up to code or we don't have a code for like, as far as uh, code enforcement and stuff like that and as far as like colors and like painting the houses. I redid my house like five years ago and I remember when I came here to pull out the permit for everything, there was a, there was a color palette to follow. And they gave me actually the, the color uh, book to choose the color based on what they had. And there were some colors that were crossed that you could not paint the houses around here in those colors. Um, same thing with the roof. Um, they said there was a, a, a special time where people didn't have the money to replace the roofs and that's why they went from tile roof to shingle. But that was written like back in the 70s saying that at any given point that you needed to replace the roof again, then you needed to bring it back to the original state. So I've, been, I've seen a lot of uh, you know, investors coming here, flipping houses, and not actually being enforced those rules. As a matter of fact, I've seen, I've, been, I've witnessed a few houses that they have actually break the whole, broken, breaking the whole um, sidewalk. There's a few sidewalks that have been broken by people that actually came here, investors, flipped the house, somehow they broke the tiles with the containers and whatever, I'm sorry, the, the sidewalks, and they just stayed like that. So there's a lot of, you know, things that it could have been handled better by the village or by code enforcement or by, you know, whoever's in charge of that. Uh, as far as like, you know, um, inspecting the, 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 the work that's been done in the house. And like I said, the color is a big thing because you don't want other certain people painting the house in all these, you know, bright or weird colors. So and my concern about, about it is actually the, you know, you just said it, the beauty of our village, the architectural, and keeping the, you know, the town uh, as it's been for many, many years. Um, so color, I think it should be a permit, whether you're gonna, co you know, collect 25 or nothing, but it should be inspected and say, yeah, that's the right color, and, uh, you know, and the same thing, we should go back with, uh, to the roof um, co t tile thing. And just not, you know, let it ride like that because there's codes and all of a sudden I, I'm hearing there's no code for this. We're not have codes to enforce like the fencing or this or that and stuff like that. It's, you know, when, and like I said, I, I was told there was a code for pain and I was given that a color palette to choose you know, within the same range of colors and stuff like that. So it's, you know. No, it's very helpful. And if, if these, um, uh, some of what you're talking about will overlap with planning and zoning as well, but I'm, I'm going to speak to Juan with Placervia, our urban, uh, our urban planner, um, because I, for example, uh, in the works right now is an architectural guide for new construction. Uh, and so it's not completed yet, but uh, we're in the final stages of having an architectural guide presented to us is something we would be able to vote on and approve. And within that, um, cool. roof and material would be addressed. And um, paint color too. And, and paint, okay, paint, paint color, color is part yes. of it, yes. So, <laughs> so. Uh, we have, yeah, yes. So, so yeah, happy. so hopefully you'll be happy to know that, that uh, an updated version of all of, of that is in the yeah. very final stages of, uh, and, and will be presented and again, to us. things like happens to um, Carlos shouldn't be happening if we have the right person sure. there because uh, uh, fortunately when I came to do, you know, everything five years ago, Carolina was there and she was great. You know, she will give you every information you needed. She will give you the right, you know, steps to follow and everything. So it's very important to have a clerk or, you know, a de front desk person that really knows, you know, how to handle stuff. We agree, and and, yes. and we mm -hmm. feel strongly that between Officer King and Marianne and the building department, yeah. that that we are there again. So Perfect. we do feel strongly that we have got the right personnel once again, and and are certainly uh, every step is in the right direction. Perfect. So. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mr. Chair, one, one quick second, if I may. Um, I'll make this really, really quickly. What, what he brought up uh, really needs to be um, in the back of our minds because it's something that really needs to be answered because when I, when, um, back when uh, uh, Mayor Black was here and, and you know, uh, um, Mayor Cabillos was on the, the, um, the council, um, myself and, and others, that was a big thing that came up, which was if somebody's getting their roof done over, okay, we said if you had tile, you have to go back to tile. But then we said there were some um, roofs that had been um, um, with shingles, is it shingles, that had been shingles for since like the 70s or 80s or something. And so the thing was, so we, what we said was, if you had shingles, if you're getting your roof done over, you have to go back to tile, you have to go to tile. So that we wanted the village to keep like a certain standard. And then what started to happen was, it was some elderly individuals right. that started to come in that didn't have the money to go from shingles to tile. to tile. So then we started to get caught up in this thing. Well, they're elderly, they're on a fixed income. They have to do their roof over because their roof is leaking. But we want to have the standard of tile roofs. So we're telling everybody else that even if you always had shingles, you now have to replace with tile once you get your roof done over. But then these elderly individuals couldn't afford it. So we were like, hmm. But then if we do it for that elderly, for elderly individual, well then what if somebody who's not necessarily elderly, but they're in like a financial rut and they had shingles. But, so, so that was the problem and that's what we really need to tackle and figure out how we're gonna, um, we need to have one answer for that, that we're gonna have to stick to. Exactly, because then the other excuse was that house was structurally um, able to able support, to, tiles. To support that roof, mm -hmm. which is not true because my house was one of them and when I redid my house, I had a structural engineer come into the house and it was perfect. So I went, I went with another type of roof, it's eco roof, it's you know, all you know, like recycled and yeah. stuff like that, but um, it doesn't add weight to the house. But it, that was the case. So a lot of people was getting away with like a structural, you know, problems and not being able to, okay. you know, support that. But it, it was it wasn't the case. Very in good. Many place, in many cases. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, before we move to, um, is there anyone else for good and welfare? All right. But before we do move to um, uh, the first agenda item. Uh, between us sitting here in the committee, uh, would we like to address the uh, request for extension on this one item that the manager is ready to present to us? Is that? I was just alerting you all oh, that right. <laughs> okay, okay. you don't have to vote right. on it. But I, you know, okay. if you want to weigh in on that. But I'm I, in the loop. I don't know if. Okay. I have I have all faith in, in in you, Mr. Chair, and Madam Manager, and and uh, and the Code Enforcement Officer. You guys do your thing. All right, very good. Uh, then uh, I believe we're moving on to agenda item uh, G. Well, no, I'm sorry, forgive me, uh, Mr. King. We're still uh, awaiting uh, your report, and I believe. <laughs> well, I, yeah, we kind of covered most. I think we have, yes. So whatever we might not have covered. We um, covered uh, statistics. Okay. Give them to you again. I Very mean, good. I have, uh, as of right now, uh, you know, um, uh, previously when I, my my first four months was mostly uh, backlog, catching up on backlog cosmetic stuff. Now we're starting to move into more contractor violations, the roofing, uh, not pulling permits, pulling permits, not getting inspections. So now I'm trying to get into that because we have so many people doing renovations in the village now, you know, and, and a lot of, not all contractors are, uh, are working on the same level. Uh, to that, uh, I've been getting a lot of complaints about uh, weekend work where contractors come on the weekend where they don't have permits or they don't have insurance. They know we're not uh, really staffed on the weekend, so I've been stepping up my weekend enforcement. And then uh, how do you uh, organize your priorities as you, um, uh, with, what are the categories of violations that you prioritize? Uh, there's no one, there's no one, only, only category that's higher than another is life and safety. That's pool okay. barrier fence, condition of the pool. Okay. Uh, unsanitary homes, dilapidated property, those are probably priority. Uh, if it's an unsafe structure, that's not something I really deal with. That's more of the inspectors that come in from CAP. From CAP. I don't really do interior inspections unless I'm invited in. Very good. Um, um, 
but I do mostly exterior, of course. So we're talking about uh, 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 stuff that really stands out. Abandoned autos, derelict vehicles. Uh, again, unfortunately, I have to follow behind the contractors because there are a lot of them that are have expired permits. Where they're actually pulling the permits, they complete the work and it was never inspected. And where they didn't pay their full fee, they did the work without actually getting a permit completed. So uh, that's another thing now I'm back on because there's so many of them. But as far as prior priority, uh, again, abandoned autos, uh, derelict vehicles. Uh, we have a few dilapidated properties. They're all been discussed before. Mm -hmm. Some are already in liens. Uh, so, I, you know, there's no point in keeping citing them over and over again because they've already in liens yeah. <laughs> for the same issue, yeah. you know. So, uh, if statistics, um, my number one statistics, probably exterior maintenance. Again, cosmetic stuff. Uh, trash and debris, trash containers. I'm starting to get a lot of trash violations where people are putting their bulk garbage out a month or two before mm -hmm. the issue where we have it sitting in the driveway. In this case, it was a misunderstanding. The guy thought he was just supposed to throw it out there, they pick it up. I told him he had to call, which he did, and they came and picked it up. Most cases, just people throwing garbage out in the front, in which they cite for, and they have to store away until it's time, or call for special pickup. Uh, trash containers being left out. The hedges are a big issue. Uh, people are not trimming the hedges properly. Uh, and again, uh, permits. So my number two violation as far as the past two months has been uh, work without permits, work with expired permits, work with suspended permits. Very good. Uh, so as far as statistics, that's, that's the general. The other stuff is uh, minor, you know, recreational vehicles, people parking a boat or trailer in the driveway, they tell them to move it, they move it. Uh, real estate signs, uh, alarm calls where people have expired alarms, but they're still expired alarm permits, but the alarm is still active. Do we have uh, alarm? If someone comes in to get an alarm permit, do we have those available? The stickers for the window. Miriam gives them a sticker, okay. so they can put it. Windows. No, one time in the past, uh, within the last two years, we didn't. We ran out. We didn't have any. So, I'd as far as I know, she has. Very good. As far as I know, I could be out of turn, but as far okay. as I know, she has. Uh, the rest is minor stuff, not the consistent. So again, the, the cosmetic stuff, exterior facade. Uh, when, the, when the dark color starts growing up the walls okay. was turning green and black but your house is white you know yep. or your roof is red but it's black very good a lot of that okay <laughs> so uh, dealing with that type of stuff oh, again the number one issue probably for the past month has been contractor violations okay and getting people to update their permits how whatever the status is or even get one <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, I had a garage conversion where they're doing an entire rehab, mm. renovation, and they did not put a single solitary permit. So I did a stop work order on that. That house is uh, 100 Northeast 88th, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so I had to put a stop work order on that because they had not a single permit doing a complete rehab. So and I check on that every day because every now and then I yep. see people coming into the house. All right. Yeah. So uh, other than that, um, again, uh, the biggest issues was been spoken about already. Very updating good. up the permits. I mean, right. I'm sorry, the, the ordinance. Yep. Uh, as far as uh, enforcement totals, uh, it's been pretty steady. Uh, Sounds like it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty steady. Um, and again, uh, like I just described to you, what, what the categories are. Very good. Uh, Council Post Roman, do you have a question? I just have a quick question. I think it's important to say it into the recording. Um, what is the proper amount of time where someone can put out their bulk trash? It should be the day prior to pick up. Okay, and that's per code. Day the day pick prior to pick up. Just like normal garbage. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I made a note regarding our communication to residents regarding that because because what I think what happens sometimes is residents hear, hey, they talk, you know, I think it's coming up like next month and then it just begins where okay i'm going to start clearing out my backyard when i have a chance one day i'm going to start clearing out the front yard when i have a chance one day i do give them a little so i'm not going to yeah. bang somebody for, for putting it out two days prior okay <laughs> well, I, I, <laughs> well i would see an additional risk i would see an additional risk to, to people putting things out so far ahead in advance is because then you get the trucks moving through the neighborhood right. trolling for I mean, that, that, bring, out, that brings extra risk into the neighborhood as, as far as people looking yeah. for opportunity they're putting it out three, four weeks ahead of time, and that's... Right. I'm just wondering if a day... I mean, that just doesn't seem... I thought it was for, for bulk, it doesn't seem right to me. 
So, I mean, I think it's important that... I'll put that as an agenda item for the next committee we meeting. We look so at that and maybe a week, I think a week is plenty, you know, or... A right, week. I wouldn't go much further than Not a week. much yeah. further than that, but then we need to make it clear and then enforce what you have been. Yes, we have um, people who already put the trash out. And the first right, trash and I think to March 24th. 95% <laughs> of the village things is a week before, right. um, which is why I asked that question. Um, so I, I definitely something that needs to go on the agenda and something we need to look at. And, you know, it needs to go on a newsletter. It needs to be announced, et cetera. On the newsletters, when we do post bulk, it does say a day before because I, I checked that yesterday. Um, but we definitely should look at that. And, and may I add to that, um, Councilperson Roman, that during uh, hurricane or inclement weather, please do not put any bulk out. That is projectile and dangerous. Do not put those things out, but a lot of residents sadly think that's the time to start doing extra trimming or throwing out mattresses or whatever. Don't put those things out on the curb which was a very big issue during the last storm. Right. Everybody throwing the buck trash out as the hurricane's barreling in. Mm -hmm. Nothing I can really do, because the storm is there and the buck trash is here, yep. and, and they're, not, they're not gonna move it. Right, and while we're at it, because there's still Christmas trees around, um, if you could just schedule whatever the day is, and we could start announcing early when the Christmas tree pickup will be. Yes. Thank you. All right, any other questions for Officer King? All right, thank you very much. You got it. Uh, feel free to stick around if you'd like. We're gonna get to the, uh, in the tracking report, the, the rec yeah, the recommendations. We'll get there quickly, so, um, uh, so we can get move through that. Uh, all right, very good. Moving on to uh, agenda item G2 now, the tracking report. Uh, I will get this cleaned up at the for the for the next committee meeting because I see already item number two I remember we were going to move to um, planning and zoning doesn't need to be in code enforcement um, the uh, first issue the and item number one I'll remove at this point because it sounds like uh, in terms of uh, citation priority officer King has things well in hand um, and so I'd be feel good to cross that off the list since uh, we're on the right track with that Code enforcement workshop. Um, uh, personally, I'd be aiming for end of summer, something like that, uh, headed into the end of the fiscal year. Give us some time to plan here for it um, and maybe come up with a, and then hopefully, for example, with the architecture guides coming into place, conference and plan discussions coming into view, then we would have some real kind of uh, meat and potatoes possibly to discuss at a code enforcement workshop by, uh, say, very near the end of the fiscal year. Uh, Community outreach. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll hmm. uh, questions, comments, concerns, and complaints re from the committee regarding um, the the uh, tracking of community outreach. Um, it it's so. I think we discussed this at the last meeting. It so very closely ties into code enforcement workshop. Do we need them as two separate tracking items? Okay, I'll 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 get that cleaned up and roll that into code enforcement workshop uh, for the next one. Um, hazards, again, as I stated at the last committee meeting, I want to remain on the tracking report just so that every single time we meet, we just have that in mind. Again, remembering back to the fire that took place on the property uh, off of Northeast Second Avenue last year. Um, and then as we're gonna discuss uh, here again, uh, the recommendations from Officer King regarding uh, pool hazards specifically, but uh, I'd like to leave that on just so uh, it's a refresher every time we see it, every time we meet. And that brings us to um, the recommendations uh, from Officer King uh, regarding uh, uh, code updates. And I'm going to pull that up here. Uh, I'll read it quickly, but um, and we'll go one one thing at a time here. But I'll, I'll you know I'll try not to be so quick that that it's counterproductive. Uh, all right. Uh, so to begin with. Uh, Overhang extensions, so all canopies, marquees, signs, metal awnings, fire escapes, standpipes, exhaust ducts, and similar overhang extensions shall be maintained in good repair and be properly anchored so as to be kept in a sound condition. When required, all exposed surfaces of metal or wood shall be protected from the elements and against decay or rust by periodic application of weather coating materials such as paint or similar surface treatment. 
Similarly, stairways, decks, porches, and balconies. Similarly, chimneys and towers. Similarly, handrails and guards. Uh, windows and door frames. Uh, Officer King, if you would just expound uh, on uh, wh what it is that we're after uh, in uh, terms of... Again, this is, yep. this is a cosmetic. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, when you have somebody who's on and so are hanging off, we do have an exterior maintenance code. Okay. Just very vague. I'm trying to uh, a lot of our code is very big, yeah. A little bit, so mm -hmm. it's specific. And uh, you know, um, again, on our steering maintenance code, I can cite literally all of that stuff. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, but again, it doesn't actually pertain to any. It literally sure. doesn't mention any of the stuff that's okay. in there. So, um, what would what would be it, a it would be more uh, you know more detail. So by updating the code to this specificity, uh, uh, what uh, for the benefit of uh, the record and, and residents who are watching the meeting afterwards. Uh, uh, so they. So I know they, it sounds obvious, but if you would just yeah, so tell they, us I mean, what, again, again, what the with, benefit to. What, what I'm yeah. looking for when I see your property, mm -hmm. that the windows should be in, 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 in workable condition, no cracks, no, not shattered, uh, that the handrails, the guardrails up the steps aren't leaning off, that your awnings aren't hanging off and there's one rod holding it up, that it's not rusted out, that it's actually painted to match, you know. And then because of the vagueness of our code currently, uh, it would potentially allow for uh, situations and conditions that would either cause um, a hazard to uh, as life as, or property. As far as the, yeah, it's no different than a fence in disrepair. Very it's good. It's a hazard. The same would, would go to the awnings, the guardrails, okay. stuff like that. Very good. Uh, Questions, discussion among the committee on that. Okay, moving on to the next item. Uh, you've identified short-term rentals. Uh, yeah, you I'm say gonna, if I, I'm just going to read just for the benefit of the record, uh, because not everybody has uh, this in front of them. So I'll, I'll just say since the last code update, there has been an increase in short-term rental properties. Mainly, companies like Airbnb have come into existence, which under our current code is not regulated by any ordinance. Most municipalities are either completely banning these from operating, or they are requiring the homeowner to register as a business like any other property that provides law. We do have a bed and breakfast ordinance, but that doesn't cover home rentals. I'm, I, I'm also aware, again, of the state trying to step in on Airbnb rentals. I, I'm not, I know they were, Miami Beach had an issue with that because of their fine amount. Okay. The state stepped in and said, we're going to cover all Airbnb. I don't know the status of that. Very good. Uh, so that might, that might uh, trump what I'm saying there. But as far as right now, I get a lot of questions on is Airbnb allowed or not? and we don't have anything that says not. So it's nothing I can really tell them. You know? So currently we don't really have any control more or less over any of that activity. Um, so we couldn't, but we're essentially losing out on opportunity for revenue for the village as well as control of a situation that could run, potentially be a yes. danger to life or property. And keep track of who's actually doing it within the village. Okay. And I do get complaints, but I, there's nothing. Okay. Yes, I, as, um, Louis Pereira, no, 10389. Yeah, right. As a Airbnb uh, concerns is like, uh, I'm sorry, uh, just really quick. Mm -hmm. I, I, for my understanding, you need to have like a tax ID yes. to run as a, yes. as a, you know, a business because you're actually running a business and it's a lucrative, lucrative business, so you're getting actually income out of it. Yeah. So we, it's, we just, I don't know if it, they have it has to be registered. It should be registered in the. We have a short-term rental, but it just doesn't cover single-family homes being rented out. It covers bed and breakfast, which sometimes some people consider Airbnb a bed and breakfast, mm -hmm. hotels, motels, but that's no. But Airbnb is like as a website and it's an uh, right. app and it's registered as an Airbnb. And as an Airbnb, you need a, a tax. Right, but the people who operate on Airbnb are independent. Mm -hmm. That's the homeowner, and they're the ones who should be. And we as the, and, and then what Officer King is saying. So just for clarity, what I'm what we're going through right now are recommendations specifically from Officer King based on what he's been experiencing out in the field. And so uh, as we take this into consideration uh, to create specific code, uh, which would eventually go to full council for a vote uh, to update our code. With the first item, it was that uh, uh, we need more specificity on on certain types of. Uh, uh, exterior fastenings and things like this and now uh, within this Airbnb is addressed but at the same time other types of short-term leases rentals etc so yeah, yeah being, we have to be careful with that because we actually right. 
losing the, the, the essence of being a neighborhood. Right. Of, uh, There's liability issues oriented. as well. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, as we, concerned as we yes. all are about the school and traffic and stuff like that, yeah. Airbnb brings a lot of traffic <laughs> so, as well. A so lot tonight of is essentially, yeah, so yeah. tonight is essentially our, our first step towards uh, doing something like codifying uh, yeah. and making changes to our code to address those specifically. It will take a little bit of time in terms of uh, requiring a couple more committee meetings and then before we go uh, cool. to full council. Councilperson Roman. I just want to remind of what our meetings, we need to hold the questions until we yes. open it up again to oh, good I'm and sorry. welfare. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, very good. Uh, now temporary structures, uh, a clarification of what constitutes a temporary structure is needed. The code exists, but there is no definition of what actually is considered a temporary structure. So this is separate from the first item in terms of uh, uh, fixtures upon, separate. right. We have a temporary structure. So, sim so similarly, the code is vague, but right, we needs have clarity. Ordinance, but it doesn't define what is considered by the village of Hotel. And again, even though this sounds obvious, what would be the benefit uh, to the uh, village of creating that specificity? Moving trailers, storage trailers like the pods, Dumpsters. No, but I'm, what I'm saying is, even though it sounds obvious, I'm saying what would be the benefit to the village of, of becoming more specific in the code uh, regarding to, this? To, yeah. Again, to, mm -hmm. to, to notify contractors, homeowners, what is actually allowed? Because we get, uh, we get huge tents. Mitigate disagreements, mitigate miscommunication. This, yeah. this is what you're allowed to have. Because again, when it comes to our definition, there really isn't one. <laughs> So okay. now I have to explain to them why they have to get a permit for it, even though the ordinance doesn't explain it. Very good. And I have to personally say, well, listen, you need a dumpster there. It's considered a temporary structure. Sure. You should be getting a permit for it. But I, okay. the ordinance does not say that. Uh, questions or comments regarding this item? Okay. Uh, and that's just, to, again, to mitigate sure. misunderstandings. Absolutely. You know. uh, all right. And then uh, the final item, I believe, is fumigation tent. And uh, essentially, you said that uh, we have a code that requires a fumigation tent permit. I suggest having the ordinance require a tent permit. A little so now we're moving from specific specificity to, to something a little more general for any occasion and base the price on the size of the tent. In addition, pest control has a separate state regulation that doesn't require them to get local permits. However, we have been making them get tent permits under a fumigation tent code. If we just make a general tent ordinance and list it under temporary structures that require a permit for any reason, it might lessen the resistance we get from pest control companies that keep trying to fight the permit. So as it stands right now, you're saying that uh, the, the pest control companies feel they have a foot to stand on to say they don't owe us any fees. Correct. And we're trying to say that, in fact, they do. Because the state this, has them uh, exempt and, for And this permits. would help eliminate that back and forth Perfect. And and we could simply say so. Then, um, uh, in theory, then uh, moving to um, yeah, go, go ahead, Councilor. So my only thing with that is that if the state has them, they're not used to checking if they need a permit or not. And they usually so, don't. Right. Correct. <laughs> so do you get what I'm saying? So if we're not because there, most municipalities don't have them get correct. permits. Correct. So I, that would be my only um, flag that I would raise with that. Uh, what is the fee uh, attached to this particular permit? I know I saw I had fumigation yes. specifically. Is I think all tents are 100. Okay. Um, if I'm not mistaken. I think all tents are right now 100. And then uh, one of the questions I was going to have would be if someone were in terms of temporary structures requiring a permit, if someone's throwing a, a house party currently and they want to have a tent for uh, protection from the elements, uh, they, they it's a hundred dollar fee. They have to pull a permit uh, for a fumigation tent, a recreational tent. Okay. It doesn't, doesn't make a difference. All right. So um, my code there would separate the two. Okay. So or it's not, at least scale it down. Cause if you put a small tent or a big tent, sure. you get, you're paying the same fee. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like with the, the first uh, three items, we probably have fairly well agreement and certainly um, uh, would be very beneficial to uh, meaningfully uh, pursue those three paths uh, sooner rather than later. And as far as this tent, it sounds like there may be discussion uh, among the committee uh, going forward about what action we might take on that. Does that sound about right? Okay. Uh, Mr. King, thank you sincerely for uh, for doing this. This is uh, certainly. Okay, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, I, oh, I want to yeah. add this Did extra I miss the sheet address because for I think it? yes, I think there was a page left out. Okay, and I'm going yeah. off the computer. So, yeah. Yeah, I know. Okay. I All right. Yeah, and that was actually one of the. Okay. 
This is the second page of the statement. All right, so this is uh, the, the section titled Vacant Structures and Premises, correct? If you remember right. Uh, Okay, two items. Okay. Vacant structures and premises. All vacant structures and premises shall be maintained in a clean, safe, secure, and sanitary condition. So this is going to the derelict properties. Uh, the exterior of all vacant structures shall be maintained in a manner required of occupied structures. So uh, yeah, what, what you're saying is, as it stands currently in the code, there's no uh, clear. Sorry. Again, I could cite it on the exterior maintenance, and I have been. Just, again, to, to find it, detail it. You know, you're going to leave this home here because you're living in New York. It still must be maintained. As if someone's living Or there. if it's vacant because you, whatever. Right. It still must be maintained as if it's occupied. Yeah. I have some homes that are boarded up. So this give us a little more teeth? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any uh, questions or discussion regarding that? Very good. Uh, accessory structures. Uh, all accessory structures, including detached garages, fences, walls, swimming pools, shall be maintained in a structurally sound condition and in good repair. Uh, item one you have is water clarity and swimming pools. Uh, item two is swimming pool barriers. A swimming pool shall have a pool barrier that meets the requirements of the Florida Building Code pool barrier requirements in effect at the time of construction of the pool. Or, if constructed before such requirements went into effect, shall have a barrier that meets all of the following minimum requirements. So we have nothing in our code. There's uh, nothing in our code right. that says uh, they can have they can have black water. Nothing says they can't. I and cite it anyway because it's a health hazard. Sure. However, I have no code to actually write them for, so I refer it to the Florida Department of Health at right now. And then in terms of pool barriers, what are we doing? I cite yeah. that for uh, a yeah. uh, life and safety issue okay. because you must, it doesn't matter if the pool is. So again, this will give us teeth to have right. the specificity uh, in there. Even if you don't have water in the pool, you still must have a pool barrier fence. Okay, the barrier must be at least four feet high on the outside. The barrier may not have any gaps, openings where someone could get through. Uh, the barrier must be placed around the perimeter of the pool and must be separate from any other fence or wall or enclosure surrounding the yard unless the fence, wall, or other enclosure or portion thereof is situated on the perimeter of the pool is being used as part of the barrier and meets the barrier requirements of this section. Uh, the barrier must be placed sufficiently away from the water's edge to prevent a young child or medically frail person who may have managed to penetrate the barrier from immediately falling into the water. Um, and uh, any, any... So is that the barrier that goes around the pool, like immediately around the pool? If you don't have a perimeter fence, like a privacy fence... Oh, so it's only if they don't have the perimeter right. fence. You, if, oh, okay, if got it. If you don't it. have a perimeter fence, you must have a fence directly around the pool. Got it. Okay. But right. if they have a fence, clearly yeah, no. Oh, as, lo okay. as long as that fence would not be broken or damaged in a way right. that someone might be able to get through the fence okay. and then find themselves like a child, for example, squeezing, you know. Okay. So, it. yeah. So the fence would have to be in, in good repair. So. All right. So even if right. it's a perimeter privacy fence, it still must be. Right. Okay. okay. Very good. Uh, and then, oh, sorry, any other uh, questions or discussion on that item? All right. And then uh, street numbers. Uh, so uh, one one address sign shall be required for each principal building or use on premises showing the numerical address designation on the premises upon which they are maintained or multi-unit buildings which utilize a roadside marquee signboard a roadside marquee or signboard the full building address shall be posted on such marquee or signboard the address shall be posted in a color contrasting that of the marquee or signboard or building a minimum of four um, or building a minimum of four inches uh, the size of the letters for residential and six inches for a commercial structure and of sufficient size to be plainly visible and legible from the roadway. When the building utilizes multiple addresses, such as multiple occupant mercantile buildings, the address range shall be posted as indicated above. Uh, and so um, I imagine this is for uh, emergen expedition of emergency services. Yeah, is that correct? public safety than okay. me. I mean, if you're an ambulance or a police officer trying sure. to find an address, and you can't see it because it doesn't exist. <laughs> so. I agree. I agree entirely. Any any uh, questions or discussion from the committee on on that item? I don't know how often this happens, but I was happening when I was looking at the home of the month. Um, there was a couple homes that you know a lot of times I don't know who they belong to, so I'll look on the public records on the and it'll be a different address than what's posted. Um, I have examples that I can forward, but I don't know how I often. I'll yeah, I, I don't know how often that happens. I don't know if it's because it's two lots and there's, uh, I came across it. the appraiser site. Yes. Sometimes that site is off. Oh, okay. It, it is off. You click one property and it won't, that address won't come up, but different addresses will come up. It was this, it was the same property, same residence that owned it. Okay. 
but it was a different address, I like a different the, number. I just had the same issue on Northwest My uh, North Miami. Northwest. North Miami. Oh, look at that. I clicked the property. Yeah. And it gives me a different property, same yeah. homeowner, but it went to a different lot. Yeah. Even though I'm clicking that. Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Okay. I'm just, I don't know. Just thought I brought that up okay. since we were yeah. talking about numbers. So maybe through this, uh, if we get to that point, then uh, that might help residents even even clear up some records as well. So, Absolutely. all right, very good, um, Officer King. Any uh, anything else regarding uh, what you brought us? Uh, again, I want to say thank you. This is uh, clearly a great deal of work that you did on your part, um, and um, and I believe it is really incredibly helpful. It's just to make not just my job easier, but right. to make for the citizens to clearly sure. understand what I'm looking for when I'm out there and to help them with their problem, you know. Yeah, and one thing we've certainly learned as we've been readdressing, readdressing the comprehensive plan is that uh, any, what the residents spoke to tonight in terms of outdated code issues and things like that. So this is um, uh, fantastically helpful. So again, thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see, back to the agenda. I think we're uh, about ready to wrap this one up for the yeah. evening. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, one yes, go ahead, please, Mr. Nixon. Um, we were talking about taking the uh, the community outreach um, uh, line off the tracking report. Yes, uh, possibly taking that off. Well, um, rolling we, it into the, the uh, rolling code it into the code workshop. Workshop. But I was yeah. thinking, like for example, um, um, Mr. Pickup. Kirk brought up the thing, the situation about uh, you know he you know he would he would want to see um, addresses on the website. It's kind of like community outreach. So there might be things in between the code enforcement workshops that we might just want to keep it on there because there just might be different things that might come up that might be like more community I'm outreach. okay with that because I'm thinking also in terms of uh, like a PSA associated with bulk pickup, for yeah. example, could fall in that category so as well. So we just might want to keep it there. Just okay. I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it, the workshop is actually community outreach. So I don't know if you want to do it the Roll other, the other round, way. Roll the where other way. is community yeah, outreach, I'll do that. and then the sure. code enforcement okay. workshop falls I'll do that, or I'll roll that the other way, yeah. so the, yeah. the workshop falls under community outreach. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, both of you. All right, very good. Um, uh, one last opportunity for good welfare, if uh, anybody would like to speak. Name and address, please. Courtney Kirk, 265 Northeast 87th. Um, just a couple of comments, first on the bulk, um, the one day I know is what's actually in the code, but one of the things that's actually beneficial is if you're out a little bit early when they do, we're in the third day, if they don't have enough to pick up in the earlier days, they start doing the other days. So it does clean up the village faster and get more stuff out. So just something to consider there. It can be there. surprising for residents who believe that they have a certain amount of time and all of a sudden they're shocked because like 12 to 24 hours got taken away. Right. Okay. So uh, I don't, I'm not saying two weeks or anything sure. stupid like that, but right. you know, just a couple of days makes a world of difference, sure. both in them picking it, us, picking it up as well as putting it out. Um, on the tent permit, um, if we're charging the, a permit fee to the folks who are doing the fumigation, that's just going to get passed on to the villagers. So this then just becomes purely as far as I'm concerned, a revenue generation, which quite honestly to Why Officer not? King's statement, he's not in the revenue generation business, he's in the compliance business. So something to think about there. Um, finally, uh, to some extent, asking Officer King, but the um, committee and then the council to support him if he's trying to get compliance and he can only cite and a lien comes up and then the people are still doing nothing, is there anything we can put into code, into ordinance that gives him an additional weapon? Okay, you're not cleaning up your, your yard and your thing is uh, um, dilapidated. I've given you the three sites, the three sightings. You're, there's a lien on your property. Still dangerous for kids to run by and play. Is there anything else we can do to get it into compliance, even if the village has to pay and adds that to the lien plus interest? I'm trying to figure out for safety what we can do. Because there are a couple houses, and I'm sure Officer King is aware of, I'm, that you walk by and it's rusted stuff, roofs falling down. 
It's dangerous. I believe as we get to that point, what happens is a uh, hearing with the magistrate essentially is is triggered, right? And then that resident either has the option to show up and defend themselves or present their, their case uh, or not show up and then a, case, a judgment will be made in their absence. And uh, beyond that, in terms of compulsion, right, I don't know that we do have any mechanism to, uh, beyond making that judgment, creating the lien, generating that, that uh, fine, right, uh, I don't know if the manager uh, can we have or, higher or, or fines or the after would be the able third to... time or after the first month of non-compliance after the hearing those sorts of things that make it so economically unviable for people not to comply and especially when some of these are investment houses absolutely well, the, the, yeah. as council person said it was the lien is in effect that's a daily fine so it could be up to five hundred dollars per day and that fine runs into infinity until the property is, is in, in compliance or so and we do, we do have one property in the village right now in such a situation and that is where uh, someone looking to flip the house was surprised to learn that there was a lien on that property with fines generated just as he explained uh, that essentially uh, totaled uh, I believe it was equal to or even almost more than what they paid for the house and so they learned of that reality after they had closed the deal and are now, uh, and then because they are not the ones who were in violation, are now in intense uh, uh, negotiations trying to reduce that which would have been owed to us. And so um, there is one property where we have a sh an, an exact example of just that. And so, okay. Uh, my, my, before I sit down, my, my final comment. We, since we, the village, have had to bear the brunt of that either ugliness or unsafeness or whatever, we should be extremely hesitant to negotiate down any of those fees. I'm sorry to the person who bought it unknowing and stance. doing a poor job <laughs> of research, but we had to deal with walking by that junk forever. I'm sorry. Uh, don't be sorry. I agree with you, and I've used those exact words in those negotiations. Um, I, I can tell you, um, Courtney, that we already cut four grass, you know, four yards every other week. Uh, you know, we are limited in our resources and, and personnel and, and, and funding, so I don't really want to take on doing the work of, uh, you know, maintaining uh, people's um, yards. So what we have to do is really enforce and then institute the hearing. But uh, the hearings. Thank but to his thank question. You. My, my, my only point was, is there anything that right. we need to provide Which for him to be able I was to ask, slam it a I little I was going to ask if the attorney might, would you yeah, be? I mean, if, yeah. if, if there's a property that a health safety hazard and, and in disrepair, the inspector can report it to the code enforcement board, and the board then can order the immediate uh, remediation, or rect, you know, rectifying what the issue is, and then that, the cost of that um, approach would, can be added to the um, lien on the property. Obviously, once you have a lien on the property, it collects a daily fine at, at the statutory interest rate, and then the village can always make the decision at some point if it chooses to, to enforce the lien, um, foreclose on the lien, just like any other um, encumbrance. So um, there's, a, there's a number of options that the village can have. A lot of cities don't do that um, for various reasons. Obviously, you take the property subject to whatever mortgage that might be on the property, but if it's a property that um, the village sees is in its best interest of moving forward and they can do that. Again, sorry to state your name and address. Hi, Jay Ribeiro, 225 Northeast 86th Street. In regards to the liens and forfeiting the actual balance, this is why we're asking if you publicize those properties with the deficiencies, one, we'll know that you're working on them. We don't have to be sending you emails asking what's going on. <clears throat> Two, we would know as a buyer that that property has a lien. And also, if you add on the lien amount that's accumulating to those properties, it would help the new property owner. That's one item. So the second item is when you issue permits, and I know this was, this, this was something that was done when Carolina was here, when other people were here, with the exception of 
the previous people before you, Garcia and the other one. Whenever I got a permit, I was told, post it in the window. Post it wherever it's visible. It's not been done. That is why I'm, I'm sending those emails, because I don't know what's going on. And since you don't have a website for me to look it up, that's where the miscommunication is happening. So if your staff is not doing it, please communicate to them that they need to address with the person who's buying that permit to post it. Item number three, it's work that's being done after hours by contractors or private people, especially a house here on 87th Street. It, there's five or six cars that come in, trucks and whatever, and they're parking over the sidewalk. I have to walk, and so our other residents have to walk out to the street. And if you know, 87th Street, it's dark. Half of the lighting does not work. And the other half blinds you so you can't see anything. <laughs> yes. So not, I'm not, yeah. that is my issue as to why I'm writing those emails, mm -hmm. especially with the volume of traffic that's going on on 87. It is a danger to the community. Item number four, which is also addressed in my email, Airbnb. We need to act on that now because it is a profit generating item for the homeowner. I'm not against for people being a business owner, but the property that I have addressed in my email this weekend had a party on their roof deck and they were videotaping a music video. You don't know the property, but you could see it directly behind my house. They built a second story roof deck without a variance, without asking me if I was comfort with it. And it's being rented almost every other day. But this weekend, there was a video going on. Music video, and who knows how sex driven it was, because I could see the individuals half naked. I have plenty of trees in my backyard, but I could see what goes on in that second story. It's an open sun deck, yeah. and it's an Airbnb. May I ask you something about that? Were you able to take photos of this no. activity? Okay, I'm asking. It's late at night. My, my camera is gonna flash the, hit a flash, and they're gonna see it. Okay, but I'm asking because we, we aren't there, so we can't see it, and we can't enforce by just your word. But, I mean, that violates a number of things. We have mm -hmm. a, a memorandum of understanding with the county's um, filming and tourism board. Uh, so they should register if they're filming something in El Portel, and they need to have a police officer, uh, off-duty cop present as well. So there are some things that, you know, we, if we don't know about it, though, we can't enforce it. But, you know, a photo or just next time you see something, take a photo if you can or just document or get something, and then perhaps we can follow up if it's, you know, during off hours. If it's, right. you know, I can't go what, out there at night. Do we know night. what address he's referring to? Right. Yes. I have the address because I have these. I know what you're referring to. And that's what I brought up the Airbnb code. Right. Up because we, I can go there and knock on the door and say hello, but right after that, and it's not the there. owner yeah. because I spoken with the owner. The owner moved to the Bahamas, and the person that rented it told them that it was for him and his elderly mother. And the following day, or the following months, and the following weeks, I've been seeing different people, and I called the owner directly in the. In, to his cell phone, cell phone in the Bahamas. And he claimed he didn't know. He claimed he was taking back the property in April of last year. And it ha doesn't happen. But what happened this weekend, and this is why I am here, because my email specified it, but didn't go to that extreme, that property needs to be looked at more closely. So that's what I have. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Code enforcement. <laughs> what a night. All right. This is all very good, very good. I believe uh, I'm asking at this point if there would be a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. I'll second that motion to adjourn. All right. Uh, very good. Uh, with that, 
the code enforcement meeting for March 3rd, 2020 will be adjourned at 8.54 p.m. All right, thank you. <laughs>